Welcome to one of the last episodes in our series, The Future of Sharing, where we're trying to look at how do we make the sharing economy work for everybody. And over the last year, we've been broadening into how do we make the, the platform economy kind of work for everybody. I'm Pete Leiden. I'm the founder of ReInvent, the media company that's driving this conversation. And we're doing this all in partnership with Airbnb. Now, we started a couple years ago, um, just again, uh, starting these conversations little by little, filling out kind of all the things we could do differently to deal with the repercussions happening with the big changes in the sharing economy and ultimately as that transformed into the platform economy. And so we're wrapping up with some big picture conversations and none is bigger than the one we got here with Eric Reese. So Eric is essentially, as many people know Eric, uh, is really the author of The Lean Startup. Uh, it is um, a famous book that's had over a million copies. It's in 30 different languages. Last year he came out with The Startup Way, a kind of a follow-up book on that. But actually what we're going to be talking to him about is his new venture, which is the long-term stock exchange. So Eric, it's great to have you here coming oh, through. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it's good. Um, I tell you what, we have enough time here to really kind of talk this through. And I've kind of, actually I was at the Nuco Shift Forum where you were talking with John oh, Battelle great. about that. And, but here's what I would like to do is I'd like to just step back, as we'd like to do in this kind of framework, and think of the big picture here. And so sure. let's think of the problem set that we're trying to wrap our heads around here mm -hmm. that ultimately what you're doing with your new venture might help solve, but it doesn't have to be just to that. So we're looking at, you know, there's a lot of dissatisfaction of how the economy is working, the inequalities and all the kind of problems with that, or there's problems yeah. with, you know, uh, there's been a tech backlash. There's a bunch of things happening here. So let's start with the economy. When you look at the economy as it exists now, what are the kind of things that you're seeing that could be really improved or that are getting really problematic from your vantage point? Sure. It's funny because the problems are almost so obvious. We don't even talk about them anymore because we've just gotten used to it. So, so of course you have the, like, there's the stuff that makes the headlines about, you know, the stock market is up or down, or, you know, this, there's this scandal with this company or that scandal. Um, maybe if you go a little bit bigger picture, you know, people start to look at like total crisis of opportunity that's leading to opioid, de opioid deaths and, and drug addiction and so many parts of the economy, you know, people who are being left behind. Then you start to like get even bigger pictures. Like, well, oh, you have really obvious problems with sustainability and with uh, inequality where, you know, wherever you fall on the political spectrum, I think we can agree that the elite decision makers in business, in government, you know, across the spectrum who have been tasked with kind of guiding their ship of state over the last few decades, have adopted an unusually short-term framework where we keep punting those serious problems into the future and we keep taking shortcuts to not do the job that we set out to do. So, you know, take globalization uh, and the kind of liberalization of trade policies from, from a few years ago. The only moral case for globalization is that although there are winners and losers in any given nation when you do globalization, the overall gains from trade are, you know, so, so high that you can easily redistribute from the winners to the looters to the losers to compensate them to make them better off. And because there's so much trade surplus, you can make everybody better off by doing that. So we did the first half of that plan. We liberalized trade, we created winners and losers, and we said, ah, that's as far as we can go. Everything else is too hard. You know, to have to. So it's like, you just see that over and over again. And obviously in environmental sustainability, I think it couldn't be more obvious. And then you start to look at the broader, like, what, what is the level of opportunity available to people who live in our society? Like, you know, who's eligible to become an entrepreneur is, of course, an issue very near and dear to my heart. Uh, you know, th the trends are, are abysmal. The rate of new business formation is down, even as we're living through a kind of technology renaissance and a golden age of Silicon Valley and so much entrepreneur stuff. Entrepreneurship is happening on TV and in the news, but the actual broad economy has become much more rent-seeking and much less dynamic. And then in, of particular interest to me is uh, that there's so much concentration now of power among corporate entities that the number of public companies in the United States is half what it was 20 years ago. Is that right? So then, wow. it's, I mean, it's, it's astonishing if you look at the graph. It's a straight down line. Now, you think about the last 20 years, a lot of interesting macroeconomic events have happened in the last 20 years, right? We have a dot-com bubble boost. We have a major recession. We've had all these crazy things. The graph of number of public companies in the United States does not show any evidence of any macroeconomic effect. It's literally straight down linear trend. And so, like, what's the plan? We're just going to keep letting private equity and mergers and the lack of IPOs, you know, if we let that keep going. Eventually, there will be, what, seven gigantic companies that own all the public wealth. And the opportunities for regular people 
to invest in growth and to participate in the innovation of the next year, that's basically been made illegal. And, and you know, I, I can keep going and going and going. Okay. But like, well, two, 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 two. what are we doing here? <laughs> That's a great step. Just, just a couple, a couple quick things here, just on those last yeah. couple points. What is going on with this kind of drop off of the public companies? I mean, you, what's your kind of analysis of what's really going on there? Well, so, so there's clearly three, you know, interrelated trends that I think have a common root cause, but you got to separate them out and look at each. The first is that private companies don't go public anymore, like to a to a crazy degree. So. You know, when Amazon went public, I think they had been around for three or four years, and their IPO raised something like fifty million dollars in 1997. Which, yeah, crazy. I mean, you can't even you can't even imagine that today. Today, fifty million dollars is a pretty large Series B for a private company. You know, just like yeah. the game has totally changed since then. And that means that if you had the chutzpah to buy Amazon's IPO as a retail investor on that day in 1997. And hold it from then till now. Now, most people did not have the courage for this because it's been a very rocky, it has a very rocky path. But if you had the courage to hold it, the returns have been astronomical. So if you put that in your retirement account, you could retire on the strength of, you know, of Amazon. I, I was just talking to, to Steve Case the other day, the founder of AOL. He's, he's an LTSC supporter. And he said people still to this day come up to him on the street and thank him for helping them put their kids through college. Because the AOL IPO, if you bought that stock and held it for seven or eight years, it went from, you know, I think they had a total valuation of like $75 million when they went public. And, you know, eight years later, they were, you know, multi-billion dollar company. So it was just a crazy run up. And, you know, it was, it was an age of irrational exuberance. I'm not saying every tech stock is going to be the next AOL, but there was a broad opportunity for regular people to experience growth in their portfolio. That's now evaporated. By the time companies go public now, that you know, the average is up to, I can't remember what it is, 9, 10, 11, 12 years. I, like, I think it'll be 14 years pretty soon. Uh, companies like Uber, even, even Airbnb, Facebook, all these companies in a previous era would have been public a lot sooner. That's one trend. Okay. And, and that's not to say that they're doing something wrong. They're, they're just, that's a fact of how they're operating. And given the disease in our public markets, I'm not even thinking, I'm not sure it would be good for them to go public sooner because we haven't fixed the root cause problem. That's one. Second is you have a lot more private equity than you ever had before. So a very common strategy to take a, a company that can't function properly as a public company is to buy it out take it private, fix it, and then eventually relist it. But the relistings take, have been taking longer and longer and longer as it just people say like, gosh, it's awfully nice to be a private company these days. Maybe we don't, you don't need to do that. And then there's just more money available to private equity. It's kind of, you think about all the energy that went into leverage buyouts back in the day. So, you know, some of that same energy got diverted into, into the kind of modern activist world and some of it got diverted into the modern private equity world and whatever. You think of those trends, it's a fact that there's more of that activity than ever before. And the third is there's much more consolidation. So the although the number of public companies is in decline, the total market cap has been relatively stable. So what that tells you is that the average size of companies is going way up. And I think that's just very much in keeping with the general trend towards inequality all through our society, that as you have these big platform companies, as you were saying in the intro, the returns to scale, the returns to capital invested in those companies are significant. So it's not and I'm not claiming anything nefarious is going on, but it's a fact that we have much more M&A uh, activity than we ever had before. And a lot more financial engineering. I would kind of say growth through financial engineering is much more common now than growth through organic innovation uh, in the public markets. So, you know, I, I don't want to paint a bleak picture to say that this is, you know, someone's done something evil or bad here. These are just the facts of what's, uh, what's unfolding. So some people like Tim O'Reilly and we've done a lot with Tim, um, you know, yeah, he's terrific. he tries to think about it, you know, the algorithms that are guiding the entire economy. I mean, do we readjust that? What's interesting is you're yeah. kind of taking a subset of this and thinking, is there a in institutional structure maybe that could be different that would yeah. help this problem? But, but before we get into your institutional structure, what, what do you think about that kind of framing of we're at a point that there may need some really fundamental reworks at the kind of ma the very highest level of like the guiding principles of the economy yeah. or the kind of um, redistribution of wealth in a more fundamental way. I'm just curious where you sit in that kind of. Yeah, kind of so I have, I, I kind of, for whatever reason, my point of view makes neither side of that debate very happy. Because on the one hand, I do think fundamental changes are needed. And I think we have to move away from symptoms and towards root causes. So I'm really, I am a fan of some pretty fundamental change. But I, what I worry about is when people start to talk about grandiose, futuristic science fiction type changes, it tends to distract us from the opportunities for change that we have right now in front of us. 
So, uh, you know, you remember that there was a, a fetish for a while, even among anti fuel efficiency uh, folks to get excited about fuel cell cars. Remember, like, totally. George W. Bush would give speeches about fuel cell cars. Totally. And, you know, it was like perfect for everybody. We could get excited about fuel cell cars because it was not practical in the short term. And so we could continue to, you know, <laughs> cut fuel efficiency standards and we could kind of gut the, the, like, the stuff that's right in front of us. You forget, there's no point making any, you know, making gasoline less toxic because. Eventually, fuel cell cars are going to save us, and that becomes an excuse to not do anything. You know, the criticism goes both ways. Like, I'm I'm a huge fan of universal basic income and the jobs guarantee, and the kind of the different mechanics people are, are trying to think through about how do we make the economy fair for a potentially jobless future. And as automation takes over, like, absolutely, we should be thinking about that stuff. But at the same time, right now, Medicaid, Medicare, like all kinds of workforce support programs are under attack and being defunded today, and if we need universal basic income in the future, then we it, even more so we need Medicaid today. So we, you know, with the same level of energy and political commitment, we have to those futuristic projects we have to bring to bear now. So when it comes to capital markets and and all this, you know, public governance, everything, there's a tendency to sort of say, hey, the SEC's on a bad job. Congress has to blow this whole thing up, or you know, we you know a financial transactions tax. You know, I think it's like a, a, a again very sensible proposal, but. What is the plan to build the political capital and coalition that would be necessary to pass a financial transaction tax between here and now? It's like I haven't heard any practical idea about how to make that happen. You know, uh, uh, Thomas Piketty's wealth tax. I totally understand the logic of it, but what's the plan to make that happen? In the meantime, the SEC, the stock exchanges, the existing institutions we have right now have tremendous latitude and discretion to do good stuff, but they don't. That doesn't happen by magic. We have to apply ourselves to push them to do that. That's our role as citizens to see that that, that happens. So can we build more algorithmic sensibilities into our regulators? Absolutely. Are there opportunities you know, to, to kind of equalize the playing field right? By, by giving the regulators the tools and the funding they need to combat some of these actors who, who are running rings around them right now? Like uh, for sure. But like can we, I guess my preference would be, can we be practical about stuff that, that addresses fundamental root cause issues, but is actually doable while we're still alive? Well, I think that's a good kind of transition actually to introducing kind of what you're up to now. So, so for folks who don't get what you're doing, I'm, I'm explain, you just, just give the layout of, of what are you trying to do in that context? Because this is exactly what you're trying to do is, is a practical well, again, yet yeah, ambitious, so I, it's my, an ambitious approach, swing. No, but I'm it's, not saying my approach is the only approach, yeah. just this is the one that's always made sense to me. Not, let me, since we have time, let me back it up and, and tell you the story of how it came to be. Because I think oh, great. it's easier to see it from my point of view. Because like, a lot of people think what I'm doing is a little strange. So but let me understand. My experiences have been really strange. So maybe that's why. <laughs> so let me walk you back to, you know, to 2011. So I wrote this book called The Lean Startup. It came out in uh, uh, the fall of 2011. And at that time, I was mostly writing for tech you know, venture backed startups and how they should be more scientific in their decision making, more customer centric, uh, more long term in their focus and more metrics driven, more, more realistic about uh, their prospects. I mean, the scan, many of the scandals that are unfolding now, I feel like, see, you know, like, right, we, you, have, you have to build that stuff in from the beginning. Otherwise, you can get yourself into, into a, a lot of trouble. So, you know, I feel like there's been a lot of uh, a lot of indication from that. And that book took over my life. So you already said some of the stats, like this book sold crazy well, and people all like there, there are literally in pretty much every major city in the world, there's a lean startup meetup you can go to, to talk about these ideas with local entrepreneurs. And it's been, it's been a part of so many startup hubs around the world, you know, building their own uh, separate startup economy. So, so I've been very proud to have been part of that and very humbled to be part of this real movement for change that says, hey, we got to create more entrepreneurial opportunity for everybody. We got to we got to make the process of entrepreneurship more rational. Uh, we got to change funding. It has a lot of consequences, you know, and how startups how should be funded, how they should grow, uh, who should get hired into them. Like, and I'm, I'm very proud of that work. At the same time, I was studying lean manufacturing and the great management ideas of the past, as well as of the present. So I was studying lean manufacturing, the Toyota production system, studying Jeff Bezos, studying Warren Buffett, right? So studying people who, who have this like fundamental long-term approach to the work that they do. The research on Toyota says unequivocally that you can't do lean manufacturing if you don't have a philosophy of long-term thinking at the base of your management pyramid. So I was saying, okay, we in the lean startup community, since we borrow a lot of concepts and, and conceptual vocabulary from 
lean manufacturing, we should adopt that same long-term perspective. And every once in a while, someone would talk to me at one of my events and they'd say, hey, excuse me, but you say we're supposed to be long-term, but you also say we should build a venture-backed startup and take it public or sell it to a public company. What's up with that? And I was like, well, what's the problem? They say, well, everybody knows. This goes back to my point about everyone knows. The emperor is like an emperor has no clothes. Everyone knows it down to the lowliest you know, factory worker. Everyone knows it. Uh, if you take your company public or you sell it to a public company, it will die. You won't be able to innovate. You're not going to be able to think long term. You're going to think quarter to quarter. And that I couldn't let that idea go. It really bothered me. How do I reconcile these two things? And what's our plan? You know, I keep going back to what's the plan with our industry? Like, how are we supposed to thrive? And then I kind of had this like almost almost like an Atlas shrugged kind of moment. Like, wait a minute. Not only are we betraying our own principles by doing things in this way. We actually are propping the system up. The system destroys value by putting short-term pressure on companies and distracts them from fundamental value creation. In order to keep going, it needs a steady supply of fresh meat to replace the companies that it's damaging. So we're we're the suppliers, we're the deals. So, so people in Silicon Valley complain about Wall Street. God, I mean, we love to complain about Wall Street and hedge funds and activists and this and that, but we prop the whole system up. And oh, by the way, we get very rich doing it. So what is startup equity really? This is an issue you know, I get into a lot of my new book. Startup equity is a very complicated financial derivative. Everyone you know in Silicon Valley, every entrepreneur you admire that got rich in Silicon Valley got rich by owning a fraction of this derivative. Silicon Valley companies don't in the short term make a lot of profits. It's not like running a small business where you, you make $100 this period, you take $30 of it home. Uh, most entrepreneurs, most founders, most employees of Silicon Valley style companies are paid in equity. The equity is a share of the far future profits of the company once it becomes an established platform. It's, I mean, it's actually financialized learning. That's maybe for a different day. But it's like very interesting that we have built this financial system that we that does done very well by us. But it has these negative consequences that we complain about. But then when you say, okay, well, why don't we do something about it? People get real skittish. So, so that was kind of one thread where this was really bothering me as the startup got bigger and bigger and I, you know, I got the chance to, to work with more and more companies. I kept seeing this, this tension. And at the same time, I had this very strange experience where big, big, big public companies started to ask me to work with them to help them implement lean startup ideas and to kind of reinvigorate their entrepreneurial DNA. That you know, when you're a 125 year old company, you, you've, you've kind of lost touch with your founders because you know, they're dead. Or for whatever reason, you, you've, you've, probably like you've lost that spark and you want to bring it back. So I did these huge corporate transformations at, at gigantic, iconic companies. I got asked to do some work at Toyota, which was a real full circle moment for me. And, and you know, at GE and P&G and, uh, and, and City and Intuit and just like, you know, really major pillars of the global economy. And that was really interesting work. And yet the same issues come up. You talk to middle managers at any public company and they all tell you they're being asked to do things that are short term that don't make sense that even they themselves think are wrong but they're like that's what the markets want i have to do it and so just this problem of the balance between short and long term i mean it's almost to the point of cliche if you're watching the current season of the hbo show silicon valley the ceo of huli sitting there at his desk pontificating about short term versus long term and you know of course he's totally full of it it's just like yeah i should give you one more story this one really struck me. When Alaska Airlines bought Virgin America, the airline, this is an issue very near and dear to my heart. Anyone who lives in San Francisco, we were the hub for Virgin America. We love that airline. You know, we all had status on it. We thought Richard Branson you know, was a genius for creating a really different airline. And due to a series of, of kind of regulatory and public market shenanigans, he had wound up being forced to sell to Alaska Airlines. And he was really upset about it. And so were all of us, you know, as entrepreneurs, right? You think being forced to sell your company, you know, really feels bad. And so we were, it was really like a sad moment here, although it seems in retrospect, that was a few years ago now, Alaska seems like they're doing an okay job with it. But at the time we were really upset. And I happened to be flying back from DC home on Virgin uh, at the time the transaction was announced. And I had just been at the SEC that day to talk to them about this new venture. And we were talking about, you know, does the public really uh, understand the issue of short versus long term? And you know, I'm in line at the ticket counter, getting my ticket, checking my bag at the airport. And I'm just talking. There's a couple of Virgin uh, uh, flight attendants and baggage handlers there. And I just said, hey, what do you what do you think about this merger? How are you guys feeling about it? And I'm not making this up. They turned to me and they're like, oh, man, this is so bad. 
public markets are so short term and greedy. And when people start, they say, make the money and they just think quarter to quarter and there's just nothing you can do about it. And you know that, and, and they, they repeated this thesis to me. And I was wow. like, I was, I mean, and they looked at me yes. kind of funny, like, like, cause I was like, wow, that's really true. And they're like, yeah, everybody knows that. They looked at me like I was the idiot, like, oh, duh, of course everyone knows that. What did you think? What did you think the merger was about? Serving customers or something like don't, but I was like, okay, the flight attendant knows this. But the elites are confused about it. Yeah. Come on, like okay, but huh? Hmm, interesting. We get paid by this system, and they don't. So, like, what's really going? It was like a fascinating moment to me to realize that like, everyone knows it's a huge problem. Yeah. But we've all become resigned to the yeah. idea that you can do anything about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So that was my that was my intro into this. That's kind of a long winded way of telling you the, the backstory. That's great. That's a great story. But go ahead. But uh, but that's that's literally how it how it happened. And so in the in the lean startup, if you read the lean startup, you know, uh, sure it sold a million copies, but I would be surprised if ten thousand people have even read all the way to the last page. You know, if if you're one of those people, I I thank you so much. <laughs> you, you read all the way to the last page. I yeah. suggested that somebody exactly. should really fix this problem. Yeah. And you know, I suggest a lot of things. You should fix education. We should fix healthcare. You know, like that's my you know, you're an author. You get to kind of yeah make a bunch of claims as much as you want. So I was like, hey, somebody should really fix all these problems. And one of the ideas I said, somebody should really figure out a way to bring investors and company managers together for mutual benefit again, like it used to be in the old days, right? Like where we were more aligned, where we understood that investors profit when companies are well run and they lose, they lose out if companies are distracted from their fundamental mission of serving customers. So we've gotten into a point where we fight with each other, but we need each other. We're partners. Let's figure out a better way to do that. And I was like, somebody should really do that. I called the idea the long-term stock exchange or LTSE, uh, in which I said, look, you need an institution that can regulate managers and investors at the same time. Sounds like a stock exchange to me. Go forth. And I sketched out in a few paragraphs, somebody should really do this. And that was, my work there was done. And that's, uh, that's how it began. Fantastic. So then to pick up on that story, so that's the idea. So then what, I mean, you know, you were doing all these things. You just came out of the book. Frankly, I think your, your kind of book that focused on the big corporate transformation was just last fall, if I recall. Yeah, that's about. right. And yet here you are starting this up. So, so what, what is that part of the story? And what, what got you finally like, sure. I'm going to so do this damn thing? I was just waiting for somebody to do this. And then eventually it dawned on me that no one's going to do it. I mean, literally, this is an idea that would not leave me alone and kept me up at night. Because I just kept thinking, why is this such a bad idea? And you got to understand, when I would talk about this with people who I viewed as knowledgeable, they would laugh me out of the room. I mean, or yell at me. I had, I had somebody, a, a book reviewer, uh, my, who read an early manuscript of the Lean Startup was like, you have to take this out of the book. <laughs> it's so bad. Your credibility that you built up painstakingly over 300 pages, you're flushing it away on this stock exchange. Get that out. You know, it's like, that's how bad an idea it was. And what's funny is that as people try to discourage me from doing it, that's like ra waving a red flag to a bull for an entrepreneur. So you yeah. tell me something is impossible. You got to understand, I went through this already with Lean Startup. In the early days of Lean Startup, people would yell at me that it was the worst idea they ever heard. I'm like, I'm gonna write a book about this thing. I got so many people like, that's a terrible idea. You should wait till you're retired. You know, like whatever, like VCs being like, if you have a good idea, don't give it away for free to the world. Like keep it for your proprietary <laughs> advantage for a portfolio. And you know, it's like, so many people were mad at me for this. I was like, oh, I've seen this before. All right, like, okay, it might, listen, most bad ideas really are a bad idea, but sometimes it's just people can't see. So I was like, well, whatever. I'll. On the side, this has been my side project for years, more than five years now. On the side, whenever I would meet somebody who knew anything about stock markets or trading, or I'd just be like, hey, listen, I got this idea. Can I run it by you and just give me your take? Let me learn about what, why is this a bad idea? And so I spent several years in the wilderness just learning about how stock exchanges work, how do capital markets work, how do IPOs work, how do mutual funds, I didn't even know the difference between a mutual fund, a sovereign wealth fund, a hedge fund. I didn't know any of that stuff. So I had to really learn from scratch. How does the system work? Where does, who gets paid and how? And why does it work the way it works now? And I had some very basic questions. So why does it work this way? Can anyone explain it to me? Can anyone justify it to me in a principled way? And if you, if you do that long enough, you eventually come to realize that although the markets today are understandable, that is, you can learn about the different individual steps that got us from there to here. Each step made sense at the time 
and often was undertaken for good reasons, as in any policymaking odyssey, you sometimes wind up you know, through many of these steps in a place that doesn't actually make that much sense anymore. You kind of lost the plot to the original thing. So like, I really think if our grandparents you know, were alive now, who had lived through the Great Depression, I, I grew up, my, my grandparents were, were victims of the Depression and the Holocaust both. And so I, all the stories they would tell me about the 20s and 30s and, the, and what they experienced and the warning signs and the dangers, I, I thought they were so old fashioned as a kid, you know, growing up in, in California and just being like, ah, oh, you know, the, whatever, fascism is long dead and uh, uh, bubbles and panics and, you know, unlike, I was like, come on, that's that's old news. And of course, now I'm like, boy, I should have been paying a little closer attention <laughs> to what my grandparents were saying. Uh, so as, as all you, you know, you come to realize the wisdom of uh, those who lived through it before as we kind of watch a replay of this whole thing. Exactly. But in particular, this aspect, the way we do our, our capital markets, kind of the, the just the basic bargain of how we run the economy. We've gotten used to it, but I think they would have found it very strange. Yeah. They would have just been like, well, why do you not want these companies to go public? And we would, we, we, no one here is saying, well, we don't want them. We're just like, well, we have this excuse and that excuse. And, the, and they're like, but why would you want Russian oligarchs and, you know, and, and Saudi Arabia sovereign wealth fund and all these wealthy, unaccountable, non-democratic actors? Why would you want them funding all the innovation and growth in the economy instead of ordinary Americans retirement? And no, nobody says that that's what they want. We just make excuses. Well, but that's just kind of how it is. And we have these, and they, they would just, I think they would be like, look, we, we built you this beautiful house with a very robust foundation. And it's not that we, un we understand that you're going to have to update it from time to time. Like, I'm not saying that like what, what, everything that worked in the 1930s is going to work now. Of course, there's a lot of update. The world has changed. You got to introduce technology. Like it's kind of laughable that public market trades have three business day settlements still and like, we're not looking for the stock certificate in a paper cabinet anymore, right? It's all electronic. So, like, of course, it has to be updated. But they say, but you haven't updated it. You, you, in all these cases, you've just, like, taken an ax to the foundation and used it for firewood. And then the house didn't fall over. So you you sell it. You say, oh, good job. And they're like, what? good job. This doesn't make any – like, what, are you, what have you done? We gave you this beautiful house. So <laughs> I just – I kind of feel like there's, like, a get, let's get back to basics and fundamentals mm -hmm. for a minute Completely. and ask ourselves, like, what are we really trying to accomplish with our capital markets? Like, isn't the – point of it its fundamental purpose to take the excess you know savings of ordinary people and patient pools of capital and match that with innovators who want to create new uh, and valuable things like everything else should be a second order effect right we, we I think we kind of let the tail wag the dog a little bit so so i don't because i come at this as an entrepreneur not as a policymaker not as an activist not as an academic for whatever reason i'm like oh the way you solve this problem is through a startup course like whenever when all you have is a hammer everything looks like a nail so that was that was my hammer let's make a startup and so i created this company the long-term stock exchange to try to just try to implement this vision and see how far we could get and at first it was just an experiment let's just see you know we don't create new stock exchanges very often and and new listings venues like nasdaq and nice right we haven't really created a new one of those in a very long time so let's try it. Let's see, you know, what would be required. And so it took me years and years to understand, you know, the legal complexities and everything. So like, you know, it's, it's been, it's been a quite an odyssey, but, but we're here now. You're here now. Exactly. Here we are. It's about to happen. Okay. So by the way, your idea of this outmoded system is it, so true in so many things actually right now. There's this entire, in my, my opinion, which, which I don't think we should go there, but there's this giant post-war invention kind of coming off the Great Depression, World War II, that this, the greatest generation, you know, constructed that in every single category, we haven't really reinvented it in any fundamental way. And that's why we're running into all these incredible problems. That's right. We, we just let it atrophy. Yeah. It, it, it's, it for granted. It's like it would just... Yeah, I think we like if you remember that episode of Star Trek where they land on a planet that seems like a paradise, but then you realize the planet is run by ancient machines and the people that live there have forgotten how to run the machines. Oh yeah, that's right. Right, that <laughs> we live. We are those people. We we live in this incredible paradise that was built for us by humans. They weren't supernatural. They weren't gods. They were human beings they built this for us as a gift to their posterity, and we we are not. We can't just we just take it for granted. Like thanks, thanks, but. You know, we have to do that too. Right? You have to keep it alive in every generation, otherwise it goes away. And I just think we've kind of somehow lost that ethos. Completely agree with that. And I actually believe, as it sounds like you do, 
the one community that has enough kind of wherewithal or kind of wits about them still, I think, is the tech community to kind of shake out of that and mm-hmm. somehow start making this work differently, in my opinion. And if, so, not, if not us, who? I mean, you know, obviously, like, you look at Airbnb, right? Like, they embody those principles in such a profound way. And the importance of that is not just that they built this incredible product, you know, and platform, but that they use the power that they have accumulated through that to do all this other good too, yeah. to lead the way and to kind of like be a beacon for something new. And we're going to have, I think the whole industry is going to have to standardize behind that. Like, I think the standards just have to go up. We can't, we need like the, the, the very few institutions have the level of trust that, you know, that our tech companies do or, or did before we started flushing it down the toilet for no reason. You know, it's like, yeah. we got to take that opportunity and we have to use it not just to make money for ourselves, uh, but to really like, you know, I, I call it building a pro entrepreneurship public policy, like really to repair the civic fabric of our society and to just to, like to, to, to give a model for what that should look like in a humane way. And, and I think that you know, this requires us to build political coalitions with people who've been thinking about these ideas for a long time. It, it requires us to kind of break down certain forms of ideological polarization without becoming mushy centrist. Like it's a very hard challenge. And I think, I just, I'm, I feel like we're so lucky that we have a few, so far, like a handful of CEOs who seem like they're, they're kind of up to that challenge and willing to take it on. And I think over time, the differentiation between them and the folks who are kind of just like letting the opportunity wither on the vine is going to become more and more and more stark. And the returns are going to follow. I mean, like this is also a finance, it's not just a moral thing, it's a financial thing. The returns will ultimately accrue to the people who have that long-term vision. Well, before, just to keep on this for a minute before we go into the specifics of the, your stock exchange, which we'll get to. Yeah. I mean, you are one of the few people that does touch in so many places in the tech economy. I mean, do you believe, and again, I come out of the early Wired magazine, I've been around here for yeah. over 20 years, I mean, I'm kind of tapped in that same space, and, and so I'd, I'd be interested in your take, though. Do you feel the tech sector um, could really make, take some serious leadership here, make some very magnanimous moves, uh, potentially, because there is this self-interest in playing the system, yeah. That they, there is incredible wealth to be made, but do you feel that they could kind of let go of that, differentiate themselves from the financial uh-huh. kind of Wall Street world, and really start to take some really long-term and kind of, I would call them magnanimous kind of visionary uh, shifts here and really champion them? Is, is that your feeling or what do you think? Well, I think it's, I, I mean, I don't want to be too melodramatic about it, but I think it's that or die. So, right, say like, say like, more, what do you I mean? I think if you look at the way this backlash is unfolding, we are bungling it at every step. So you remember, like a, it's a famous business school case, the Tylenol, poison Tylenol oh, yeah. recall. I do, I, I do remember that, yeah. That, in the would, 80s, right? Yeah, until I was Where around. some malicious person put poison in a bottle of Tylenol and somebody got sick and, uh, and they had to make a real fundamental choice. They could have denied it, pretended it wasn't really that big. In the grand scheme of things, it was not that big a deal. It's one bad actor. Like, they could easily have tried to minimize it and said, you know, it's not that big a deal and kind of, you know, you, you, they call it giving ground grudgingly, right? Yeah. So you can kind of be like, it's not, no, nobody was hurt. Okay, somebody was hurt, but it wasn't our fault. Okay, it was our fault, but it was just that one, you know, and you kind of, you work your way backwards and you eventually admit complicity and you kind of hope it blows over. And if that doesn't sound like certain tech companies right now in the news today, then I don't know, yeah. I don't know who you're painting. But they made the much more enlightened choice to do a massive nationwide recall of every bottle of Tylenol they took, they took responsibility and they said, we will do everything we have to do to make sure that this product is safe. And they came out of that episode and it cost them a few million bucks and it was painful to their shareholders in the short term, but they came out of that scandal as the good guys who had cleaned this up and they, you know, they started, and that was just part of establishing the, the national process for, for nationwide recalls, which had happened before. You know, like all this good stuff came out of it, but more importantly, that they, they themselves were not destroyed and there wasn't you know, like it wasn't the kind of backlash that we're seeing now. And I just like, I can't understand how we don't follow that playbook now with each of these scandals. And, and what are we really, like, why are we giving ground grudgingly instead of leading the charge into what's right? That's the thing I really don't at some like deep level understand. It seems very counterproductive. And like you watch Facebook lose a hundred billion dollars in market cap and you know, the, the, the brand equity of Facebook just be eviscerated. And why? I, I can't understand it. It seems to me like, a more enlightened, more generous point of view would would ultimately get them to a better place uh, in the end. And that's kind of the general 
feeling for me is that like if you really take accountability seriously as i think when when i like like when entrepreneurs are young and and, and early on though great entrepreneurs including mark zuckerberg seemed like he was great at this like understood that external pressures can be really helpful and you know having the smart money on your cap table and the right people on your board you know that can be a point of, of creative tension that can help you so don't make yourself into God emperor for life. Don't cut yourself off from external sources of feedback, but, you know, be the partners of every, of all stakeholders, right? Like the old idea of multi-stakeholder governance. I, I think there's like a, just a huge opportunity there for the industry if we're willing to band together and say, you know what, we're going to hold all of our companies to a higher standard, you know, and, and not just, you know, obviously I focus on long-term, uh, you know, long-term thinking. So all the issues around sustainability, um, the issues around, uh, uh, equality of opportunity for employees is a huge issue right now that I think we, we could do so much more on um, in, uh, but also, you know, think about like our challenges with diversity and inclusion, uh, not just on racial and gender issues where we've been abysmal, but also, you know, the regional inequality that we foster by, by having such a myopic view on certain places. Like there's like a 10 issues there where we could do so much better and we would be lauded for it and and actually we would ourselves benefit so it's like a very self-interested kind of generosity then in the book i lay out that there's a whole bunch of deals to be made once you start to do that stuff because we want things from dc and from policymakers and they want things from us so they you know like we have we actually have many policy outcomes in common that we want. It's like so can we make a trade so you think about all the forms of red tape that inhibit startup formation, you know, that make it hard to get started or, you know, create liability for small companies, right? Like there's a bunch of relief from those rules that we would love to have. Uh, and you think about the, the senators who have a whole program about wanting to have equity ownership be more broadly shared with employees and have more investment in workforce training and want to make sure that uh, there's educational, like there's a, an obvious deal to be made because if you do a, we may, we will have more money and we'd be happy to share that. It's like, there, I think there are very clear opportunities for real win-wins, you know, not just LTSE, but like that, that, that model across the industry. And one of our hopes with LTSD is just to demonstrate that there is a better way, that we can change these immutable things, and that there is a multi-stakeholder, you know, win-win-win-win available. Okay, so let's get to that right now. So, um, because it's a great concrete kind of example of this. So, so, so explain to people how it would work and, and, and um, just, just lay out the idea right now. Yeah, so when we sit down with a CEO, we have a very simple pitch. We will give you the same level of access to liquidity, the same breadth and depth of pools of capital as today's public markets, but without the short-term pressure. It's actually a very simple, it's a very simple offer and it's kind of a no-brainer. Now, yeah, exactly. we have to make the CEO believe that we can that we can deliver both planks of that platform, but it's like if you believe I really could give you A and B, you'd obviously do it yeah, because totally. every one of these venture backed companies is going to have to go public eventually. Even the people on TV saying, we're well, never going to go public never has an asterisk, right? <laughs> right? Never just means I don't really don't want to, but you know, you have to. So, so Jeff Jordan, the famous VC uh, and Andreessen Horowitz, he has a, has a saying, he says, there's three doors. The moment you take venture capital, there's three doors you can walk through door. Number one, you go out of business. He's like, you want to go out of business? No, you don't. Door number two, you sell to some somebody else. Do you want to sell? No, you don't. Door number three is an IPO. There is no fourth door. Yeah, yeah. So you're going to go through this door eventually. So my view is like, okay, we're all going to go through the door. So why don't we make that door as good as we can make it? And so uh, we are a new stock exchange. So we are in the same regulatory category as NYSE or NASDAQ. We have an arrangement with one of the existing uh, exchanges called IEX, where we are, are reusing their trading infrastructure. So they've been a terrific partner to us. And so we offer to companies the opportunity to list with us or dual list as part of their IPO, adopt our governance model. It's a condition of our listing standards. And then once you do that, once you enact all of our provisions, your stock can still trade freely. So we're not against liquidity. We're not against short-term trading at all. We don't, we don't inhibit that. We don't cause stock price. We don't, we don't suppress the stock price. There's some kind of liquidity discount. We are focused on integrating with what's called the national market system or nms that's an sec system a really brilliant one in my opinion that that links all these stock exchanges together and it's the it's the reason why when you as an individual retail investor when you execute a trade with your broker you don't have to worry about where the stock is listed you know the stock just just the right thing happens stocks get traded you know there's a rule called best quote where you get the best pricing at whatever exchange like it's a, it's a really quite a robust system so we integrate with that system 
And then we allow the company to benefit from the various protections that we offer uh, as, as part of their corporate governance. And so what are, what, are, what are those protections or how does that work? So for example, one of our big ideas is that short-term traders are not bad. They're just not citizens of the Republic. They're like tourists. Hmm. Tourists are good. I mean, in San Francisco, we have a huge fraction of our economy is run by tourism. So we love tourism. Tourists are great. But nobody on the planet thinks it would be a good idea that if you happen to be a tourist in San Francisco on election day, you get to vote for mayor. You go home the next day, but your vote counts. Yeah. Why? Because you don't live in San Francisco. So the people who live here and have a long-term vested interest in the outcome, like those are the people that should vote. That's what it means to be a constitutional republic. That's not unfair to the tourists. It's just separation of interest. So let's have the citizens be the governance body and the tourists be an economic body. And that's fine. So we apply that same idea to corporate governance. We have a system where the company can differentiate between the long and the short-term investors and give different benefits to the long-term investors and the short-term invest uh, investors. And it tends to be stuff that the long-term investors care about, like additional governance power that the short-term investors don't care about. When I talk to quantitative traders, their average holding period for a public equity is like 10 minutes. That's insane. So like they don't, it's not that they're bad. It's just, they don't care about governance. If they have to vote in a proxy, it's like you went fishing and you pulled out a boot and you're like, ah, oh, geez, now I have to vote in the stupid proxy because my 10 <laughs> minutes happened to overlap <laughs> with this thing. And they can't believe by the way, that employees at public companies look at the stock ticker for guidance about what to do. They look at me like that is nuts. They're like, when I short a cattle future, the cows don't freak out. So why are these, like, this is just a ticker symbol on a screen to me. Why are the people that work there think it means anything? And you're like, well, gosh, those people have short-term stock options that dominate their livelihood and net worth. So what did you expect? Like, it's like this total like, in mutual incomprehension. So it's like, let's separate those things out. Let's protect employees from the ticker by giving them longer term compensation instruments by giving them better data feeds about the behavior of long versus short-term trading. So we can say, listen, if your stock price is up or down 10% today, but the long-term investors haven't bought or sold at just at their level, then nothing happened. It's not an yeah. event, let it go. So it's all stuff like that. The, there's a series of mutual disclosures between the company and investors that are new. The investors have to, have to reveal stuff to the company that they don't currently have to reveal and the, uh, and the companies reciprocate. So it's kind of a, a two-way street. We both- like, like, what, what, Can you give one example of that? Or what, what do you mean by that? Sure, so, so one of my favorites is we require companies to report uh, earnings per share, EPS, net of buybacks. Hmm. So there are perfectly legitimate reasons to do buybacks, but an illegitimate reason is to try to manipulate earnings per share to make it look like you've become more efficient when you haven't. So we wanna make that really obvious if you're doing financial engineering and that's the source of your EPS versus you, know, you improve EPS through innovation or efficiency, God bless. But buybacks is not that. So that's a, an extra reporting standard that we have. On the investor side, if you want to become a long-term investor and uh, get the extra voting power that comes with that, it's optional. You don't have to do it, but if you want to, you have to reveal the name of the beneficial owner of the security hmm. to the company. Hmm. So you're actually saying, I, 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 you know, citizens can't be in the shadows. Hmm. The company has to know who its citizens are and know who it's accountable to. So we have to have real face-to-face -face honest dialogue and you can't do that in the street name. So anyway, so there's like a, a series of compromises and bargains between investors and the companies that as a package truly are a win-win-win. We really tried to make it work for companies and VCs and the buy side and the sell side and for regulators. We joke, it's just your average five-sided marketplace. <laughs> no big deal. Just make one value prop that works for all five groups. That's, fair. But that's why it's taken so long. That's fantastic. Okay, it's taken so long. But on the other hand, you are in the game. So what is your... Yeah. What is the timeline here? What you're trying to pull off here? Is it? Uh... Well, obviously, this is everything's heavily regulated. So we just a few weeks ago made our first public filing with the SEC. So you actually go read. Uh, it's called the Rules Change and Between Before Filing, uh, where you can see our 200 pages of legal language that describe the listing standards for the first time and explain exactly how this is going to work. The document is a really thrilling read. It includes five full pages on how fractions work. 
uh, it's, it's really, it's good bedtime reading because it will help you fall asleep. But I mean, if you, if you have a general counsel or a CFO is like, oh yeah, the well, hot shot, you know, is this for real? Like you give 200 pages that will, yeah. you can we really answer the questions about how the mechanics work. So that's, that's public for the first time. So we're super excited about that. That kicks off uh, uh, approval process at the SEC. Uh, and then if all goes well, you know, obviously subject to regulatory approval, then we'd be uh, able to start operations this year. That's fantastic. So, so what would be your pitch then? Um, so then people have to list on it. Mm-hmm. So that's just, that, just that little detail. Yeah. yeah. So no, but this, so, so give, what is your pitch? Let these private companies, Airbnb is one, um, Uber is one, but even the smaller ones too. I mean, technically, yeah. you know, I'm a startup, but I mean, um, we got a ways to go, but I'm just saying, uh, you know, what would, um, yeah, it's never too early to pitch. <laughs> I'm just curious, from the biggies to littles, though, what, 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 what's your pitch and why you'd want to be the first to step into this thing and, and why, why would you yeah. jump in? Oh, okay, so let me, let me be, I got to add one disclaimer. Okay. Uh, I am not allowed to legally solicit anyone yet. Oh, okay, okay. I'm not approved. So okay. I can give you the pitch for why it's a good idea. Okay, okay, okay. Why you might want to do it someday in the future, but I, just to clear, clear. I'm, not, I'm not soliciting you to do this, nor anyone listening. Yeah. I'm not soliciting anyone to. No, no. Okay, that's fine. Well, however you can legally say that. But just, yeah, I'm, just saying, I'm, happy, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to answer your question, but I don't want anyone to be confused that I'm performing a solicitation. Yeah, totally good, yeah, totally good. Approved. So why would and, I go and, to you and, rather than somebody else or, you know, just. Yeah, no, and, kind of and like, and I, I say that because one of our whole, like our thesis here is we have tried to do this with the cooperation of all the relevant policymakers. So we've not gone the kind of Uber route or like the you know Bitcoin route of just be like, let's just break things and see what happens. Or you know, we'll make up like this has been, we've tried to do this in a very different way, a much more, we think a much more mature way to say, hey, we're doing this in partnership with all the relevant regulators. So our pitch to companies is really straightforward. A, you're gonna have to go public eventually. B, if you go public with standard governance, you're gonna have significant problems maintaining the culture and the vision of your company into the 21st century. And even if C, you can mitigate that in the short term with maybe dual class stock or zero voting share, if you want to be like Snap or something, there there are some things you can do. All of those things are fundamentally limited because they either only apply to the CEO, they don't apply to the whole workforce of your company. So we've seen this in a number of the tech companies where the CEO is is protected, but the 10,000 middle managers are not protected. And that's a huge problem. Or they only apply to the first CEO. So what's the plan for the next, like if you want to be a hundred year company, uh, you know, uh, Brian Chesky calls it an infinite time horizon company. You got to be thinking about the future leaders of the company. What's the plan in the future to really be long-term viable? So our view is we have done the hard work of finding a standard that the whole industry can live with, that Wall Street can live with, that the regulator, everyone can live with, that holds us as an industry to a higher standard, that then allows, I think that will create the breathing room for us to be able to then, as you said, go ask for some other things that we want. And whoever goes first, sure, there's some risk because you're doing something new. But on the other hand, being willing to do something courageous is one of the ways that you signal that you think you're one of those world-changing companies. Right, you think you're at the next Google or Facebook or, or Amazon or, or Toyota. Right? You, you have a way to signal that. So we think whoever does this will be remembered as the leader who took our industry into this new place. And just to be clear, our like like the LTC is very quiet. Uh, this I've I've only done a handful of interviews on this topic ever, and I'm I'm a very verbose person, as you know, as you can tell. Mm-hmm. And like, and I'm a very public figure. I'm immediate, but like, I don't talk about this very often. We've done a handful of press mentions about it, but like, we've been quiet about this because. Uh, this is not, we don't want to be the heroes of the story. Mm-hmm. We want the CEO who makes his decision to be the hero. We're there. We're the supporting cast to let them be the leader. Who's going to take us into the, into the future because the, their leadership, the standard, the, the followership that has to happen here is not just about LTSE and capital markets. It's this broader question about what should the future for the tech industry look like. And that, that needs to be one of these, one of the CEOs to be that leader, not, not me. That's fantastic. Well, that connects us back into this um, this um, this theme that we had earlier. So, so as we're kind of kind of winding it in towards the end here of this interview, um, you've got a vehicle now um, in which you uh, not just hand waving. Hey, you know, we got to do something different. We got to do something different. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. But you actually have a thing that's going on here. 
So can you say, I don't know how, what's your constraint, but can you say what is the reception you're starting to get with this in terms of this, and it, given the moment we're in here with the, the kind of tech industry under, under, under duress a little bit here, any it's thoughts? Real, on it's been really interesting. I've been working on this for such a long time. I can really track the difference in how people respond to it. And here's the funniest part. This, this is the thing I think is really very ironic about uh, Silicon Valley. In the early years, especially, but even as recently as last year, when I would meet CEOs to talk about this idea, VCs, just tech people in general, they would look at me and say, this is the craziest idea I have ever heard. And I'm like, in the current Y Combinator batch, there is an immortality startup that <laughs> kills you so that you can live forever. And I'm the crazy one. <laughs> You're working on immortality, quantum computing, teleportation, and I'm a crazy, really, this is crazy. I don't have to win a Nobel prize in physics for this to work. This is all human. And people here think this is insanely hard. It's really funny. Like really like nuclear reactors, fusion, you know, like all that stuff is considered easier than this, which I think is really interesting. So that's been fascinating. And I actually eventually started to realize this is a gift from a branding point of view. This is terrific because people think what I'm trying to do is impossible. We get a lot of extra credit every time we accomplish something. Hmm. So it actually like it swung recently as we started to do these filings and people start to see, wait, oh my God, this is real. It, it, again, the impossibility works in our favor. Like these guys are must work, you know, they somehow did the impossible. So it's pretty, it's pretty exciting. So, but, but you, you made a point of a year ago when you said this, they're crazy. You, they were thinking you're crazy. Has that shifted? Because that year yeah. has coincided with an incredible backlash and, and really a surprising backlash. I mean, People were not ready, I think, for what's happened in the last year here. And, and it no, feels to no, me- No, we were not. And has I, that changed? Two or three years ago, I used to tell people, uh, eventually the bleep is gonna hit the fan. Like, look around. We all know there are problems. We are like, this is, this is, we should not have been surprised. I think these are very foreseeable problems. Obviously the specifics of what the catalyst would be, you know, could we have predicted the Trump election? Could we have predicted Me Too? Could we, like, there's a lot of things we didn't predict, right? Like, could you have predicted the specifics of Cambridge Analytica? No, but the general problems of lack of trust and cavalierness with privacy and, you know, whatever the, pol the political stuff. I mean, it's like, there's a number of things that the diversity challenges, um, they're just the indifference to the consequences of the products that we build just like lack of focus on ethics. I could go on and on. Like I think the, the evidence was very clear that, that we were headed for some turbulence. But when and how, you know, who knows? And look, when times are good, you know, summer's children sometimes, uh, you know, don't, don't think winter is coming, right? To, to buy, borrow another fantasy uh, metaphor. So I used to tell people the time to be investing in reform and to have a, a self-regulatory option ready to go is not when the bleep hits the fan, but several years ahead of time. So that you're ready when that happens. And that has been our case with LTSC. All, to all our venture investors, everybody, we, we have to be ready for this. Eventually, there's going to be a Theranos. Eventually, there's going to be, you know, who knows what other scandals are await. But like when I look at what's happening in the secondary markets and you know, all these unregulated transactions and information asymmetries, I see some gross stuff happening. It's going to make the situation worse. So you've got to be ready fundamentally we have to get these companies to go public again. Eventually that has to be part normal part of how we operate. So like we have to be ready with that. And it's been interesting to watch, you know, five years ago, people would say, oh, but you know, times are good. There's unlimited private capital. Why would anyone ever go public? You know, they're kind of we're much more cavalier about it. And at each year, I feel like the realism sets in a little bit more. People say, okay, wait a minute. And, and this year I feel like our timing is just, you know, to, no, by no act of genius here. It's just, it took us so long to get it done, but it's actually like miraculously worked out for us where as we start to become more real, the imperative for change is becoming more obvious. And so just to bring it to a head here, um, so one of, so when you think of the bigger the meta challenges the world yeah. faces right now, you know, the globalization backlash, climate change, um, but one of the central ones has been inequality, mounting inequality, of course. Both, both in this country, other countries, the backlash, the anger, the, 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 the desperation in many respects, that's just during yeah. our politics. So what you didn't explicitly address, and I'm, I'm kind of reading between the lines, but there's an inequality play here that you're trying to essentially say, hey, we need to get these dynamic tech companies in places where average people can get a piece of it. 
where yeah. the wealth can be spread more broadly through society, where it's not just, hey, I'm in a VC thing and I got yeah. my, you know, the rich getting richer and oh my God, you know, how many more times does, you know, this yeah. VC fund have to fuck, you know, do it. Yeah. Is that, could you lay that out a little more clearly? Because it feels sure. to me that the political wins right now and the economic wins are at a point where we got to basically fundamentally shift that. And is this one of the ways that you, you think it actually plays? I, into I mean, I certainly think that's right. Now, I think we have to be careful, you know, inequality is such a polarizing term and the politics of it are very complicated. And I try not to be cavalier with these things. So I mean, there's certain politicians who that's, that's their whole, that's their whole shtick. But I think subtlety is important here. So, yeah. you know, inequality, like the fact of inequality in the world is not a problem per se, because uh, people's talents are unequal and the applicability of talents to valuable economic problems at any given historical moment is unequally distributed, like probably normally distributed about some means. So the high stigma individuals, should they be compensated higher? Like, I don't think that's intrinsically wrong. What's wrong is a the other side of the sigma distribution. If someone's skills are lacking or not of currently of value, should they, be, should they be able to live a comfortable life or not? It's ridiculous to me to think that they should die because of that, especially because we can't predict what skills are gonna be most important in the future. So today's un totally useless skill could be tomorrow's essential skill. And you don't, you know, we gotta take a portfolio approach here. That seems really obvious to me. Plus the moral, the moral dimension of, we now have the resources to feed and clothe everybody. So what's our excuse for not doing? Okay, that's, that's A. Secondly, inequality as a drag on the economy is a huge problem because if people don't, like, I think a lot of today's corporations seem to be very confused. The, the wages you pay to employees are also the revenue that other corporations need to survive. And there are ways, so like if we suppress wages, if we uh, take all the returns to capital and not have any returns to labor, we actually starve the economy of consumption that's important. So it's like not only immoral, but also totally self-defeating. And then there's a third issue, the psychological dimension. Human beings are not strictly rational. Inequality feeds a sense of despair above and beyond the actual material privation that you see. And it's just wrong. You just, that's a, it's a, like a, almost a form of psychological torture that has all these bad effects and it fuels backlash. Even if you, for some reason, don't care about the psychological well-being of your federal citizens, if you're totally sociopath and all you care about is your own thing, even still, it's ineffective because the backlash is coming. And you know, we, luckily, we live in a representative democracy still. And so the backlash will hopefully come through peaceful means. But even if there's some people who are like, well, we done, we shouldn't have democracy then, fine. But even then, then the revolution is coming. Like the backlash happens. So we got to treat it as a fact. And luckily, I think we have the tools at our disposal to do something about this. So, I mean, obviously the sharing economy, like I don't have to tell you in this pod, maybe it was listening to this, like I think our obvious understands the distribution of, of opportunity is very important. I call it the rentership of the means of production. Hmm. Right. So like old Karl Marx saying, whoever owns the means of production has control over future capital. But like if you can rent the means of production, if you can be like, you know what, with a credit card, I can grab some servers on AWS and like run an MVP and check out something in my dorm. Right. Like it creates a, a cycle of ent entrepreneurial opportunity for a lot more people. And if you think, look at Airbnb and Uber and Amazon, all of these services as building blocks of future companies, you can compose those building blocks in new ways to create new economic opportunities. So that's obviously very important. If you're going to do that, though, you got to have a pro entrepreneurship public policy. You have to get serious about distributing entrepreneurial skills and the privilege of doing entrepreneurship, right? So, like, it's another way of looking at the healthcare debate. If you you take a risk to start a company and you put your kids' health in jeopardy, then you're not going to do it. It's too risky, right? So you can't. You don't want to amp up the risk of entrepreneurship. You want to cushion the risk of entrepreneurship. So, like, very clear policy requirements to do that. And then I think less obviously, one of the Un, unusual side effects of globalization and specialization in our economy is remember the old cliche story of I start in the mail room and I work my way up to CEO yeah, yeah. but the ladders of opportunity that vertically integrated companies provided are gone just because there's no mail room anymore right. right the mail room is outsourced to a mail room specialty company right the janitorial staff everyone who works in a non-essential role at Apple or where, you know, Google, they're not employees of the company. So they actually probably have no ladder of opportunity into management. Their kids probably don't mingle with the kids of the engineers, right? There's like not only no inner, like no um, immediate ladder of opportunity for the people that work there, but neither is there an intergenerational ladder of opportunity for the people who are part of your community. And if you really extrapolate that trend forward, I think that's truly terrifying. You could imagine company towns where like the highly paid, highly educated technology workers of the future are in the core 
and separate suburban sprawl towns of the service workers who support them and a true segregation of those communities such that if you're born into the circumstance that you can become a tech worker good for you and if not too bad for you and like that kind of dynastic aristocratic concentration of education power that, that should be anathema to every technologist in the world because first of all if the world had been set up that way originally None of us would have been in the in, inner circle. We would have been out in the burst. Like, there's no way we would have been part of the aristocracy. Let's not kid ourselves. So, like, we've been given this incredible opportunity to build a more just future. What are we going to do with it? What's our plan? And, you know, I hope, I hope we start to take it seriously. Well, you have laid out. It's a perfect way, I think, to end the conversation, which has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, I appreciate it. But, uh, and I'm really honored that you did take one of the few opportunities to actually lay it out in the kind of detail you did uh, through our forum here. My pleasure. Yeah, at, thank you very much. Uh, reInvent and with Airbnb. But, um, but I tell you what, I think uh, your vehicle is one of many ideas here, and I hope you are right. I personally also believe we're at a moment where there's some big shifts coming. And uh, I'm an optimist. It sounds like you are too. And uh, of course. let's hope it all plays out here nicely in the coming years. But thanks so awesome. much. Hey, thank you very much. For being with us right here at Eric Reese. Fantastic conversation, ending uh, one of the last conversations here in the Future Sharing series. Thanks.